from around the globe, it's theCUBE. Presenting the convergence of file and object. Brought to you by Pure Storage. We're back with the convergence of file and object, a special program made possible by Pure Storage and co-created with theCUBE. So in this series, we're exploring that convergence between file and object storage. We're digging into the trends, the architectures, and some of the use cases for unified fast file and object storage, UFFO. With me is Matt Burr, who's the Vice President and General Manager of FlashBlade at Pure Storage. Hello, Matt, how you doing? I'm doing great. Morning, Dave, how are you? Good, thank you. Hey, let's start with a little 101, you know, kind of the basics. What is unified fast file and object? Yeah, so look, I mean, I think you got to start with first principles talking about the rise of unstructured data. So um, when we think about unstructured data, you sort of think about the projections, 80% of data by 2025 is going to be unstructured data, whether that's machine generated data or, um, you know, AI and ML type workloads. Uh, you start to sort of see this, um, I, I don't want to say it's a boom, uh, but it's sort of a, a renaissance for unstructured data, if you will, where we move away from, you know, what we've traditionally thought of as general purpose NAS mm -hmm. and, and file shares to, you know, really things that focus on uh, fast object, taking advantage of S3 cloud native applications that need to integrate with applications on site, um, you know, AI workloads, ML workloads tend to look to share data across, uh, you know, multiple data sets. And you really need to have a platform that can deliver both highly performant and scalable fast file and object from one system. So talk a little bit more about some of the drivers that, that you know, bring forth that need to, to unify file and object. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, there's a, there's, there's a real challenge um, in managing, you know, bespoke uh, bespoke infrastructure or architectures around general purpose NAS and DAS, et cetera. So um, if you think about how uh, a, a, an architect sort of looks at an application, they might say, well, okay, I need to have, um, you know, fast DAS storage proximal to the application, um, but that's going to require a tremendous amount of DAS, which is a tremendous amount of drives, right? Hard drives are, you know, historically pretty, pretty, pretty unwieldy to manage because you're replacing them relatively consistently at multi petabyte scale. Um, so you start to look at things like like the complexity of DAS, you start to look at the complexity of general purpose NAS, and you start to just look at, quite frankly, something that a lot of people don't really want to talk about anymore, but actual data center space, right? Like consolidation matters. The ability to take, you know, something that's the size of a microwave, like a modern flash blade or a modern, um, you know, UFFO device uh, replaces something that might be, you know, the size of three or four or five refrigerators. Mm -hmm. So Matt, wh wh why is, is now the right time for this. I mean, for years, nobody really paid much attention to object. S3 obviously changed you know, that course. Most of the world's data is still stored in file formats. You get there with NFS or SMB. Why is now the time to think about unifying object and, and file? Well, because we're moving to things like a contactless society. Um, you know, the, the things that we're going to do are going to just require a tremendous amount more compute power network um, and quite frankly, storage throughput. And, you know, I, I can give you two sort of real primary examples here, right? Um, you know, warehouses are being, you know, taken over by robots, if you will. Um, it's not a war. It's a, it's a, it's sort of a friendly advancement in, you know, how do I, how do I store a box in a warehouse? And, you know, we have, we have a customer who focuses on large sort of big box distribution warehousing and, you know, a box that carried a, a, an object uh, two weeks ago might have a different box size two weeks later. Well, that robot needs to know where the space is in the data center in order to put it, but also needs to be able to process, hey, I don't want to put the thing that I'm going to access the most in the back of the warehouse. I'm going to put that thing in the front of the warehouse. All of those types of data, you know, sort of real time, um, you can think of the robot as almost an edge device, uh, is processing in real time unstructured data and its object. Right? So it's sort of the emergence of these new types of workloads. And I, I give you the opposite example, the other end of the spectrum is ransomware. Right? You know, today, you know, we'll talk to customers and they'll say quite commonly, Hey, if, if you know, anybody can sell me a backup device, I need something that can restore quickly. Um, if you had the ability to restore something in 270 terabytes an hour or 250 terabytes an hour, uh, that's much faster. And when you're dealing with a ransomware attack, you want to get your data back quickly. You know, so I want to ask you, I was going to ask you about that later, but since you brought it up, what is the right, I guess call it architecture for, for, for ransomware? I mean, how, and how, explain like how unified uh, object and file would support, I mean, I get the fast recovery, but how, how would you recommend a customer 
uh, go about architecting a, a ransomware proof you know, system? Yeah, well, you know, with with Flashblade and and with FlashRay, there's an actual feature called called safe mode, and that safe mode actually protects uh, the snapshots and and the data from uh, sort of being a part of the of of the ransomware event. And so, if you're in a type of ransomware situation like this, you're able to leverage safe mode, and you say, okay, what what happens in a ransomware attack is you can't get access to your data. And so, you know, the bad guy, the perpetrator, is basically saying, "Hey, I'm not going to give you access to your data until you pay me, you know, X in Bitcoin or whatever it might be." Right? Um, with 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 safe mode, those snapshots are actually protected outside of the ransomware blast zone, and you can bring back those snapshots. Because what's your alternative if you're not doing something like that? Your alternative is either to pay and unlock your data, or you have to start restoring, restoring, excuse me, from tape or slow disk that could take you days or weeks to get your data back. So leveraging safe mode, um, you know, in either the flash or the flash blade product uh, is a great way to go about uh, architecting against ransomware. So I got to put my, my, I'm thinking like a customer now. So safe mode, so that's an, an immutable mode, right? Can't change yeah. the data. Um, is it, can, can an administrator go in and change that mode? Can he turn it off? Yeah. Do I still need an air gap, for example? What would you recommend there? Yeah, so there, there, there are still, um, uh, you know, sort of our back or role based, ac role based access control policies uh, around who can access that safe mode and who can. Right. Okay. So, uh, anyway, subject for a different day. I want to, I want to actually bring up, uh, if you don't object, a topic that I think used to be really front and center, and it now be is becoming front and center again. I mean, Wikibon just produced a research note forecasting the future of flash and hard drives. And those of you who follow us know we've done this for quite some time. And you can, if you could bring up the chart here, you, you, you could, and, and we see this happening again. It was originally we forecast the, the, the death of, of quote unquote high spin speed disk drives, which is kind of an oxymoron. Uh, but you can see our, uh, here on this chart, this d d hard disk had a magnificent journey, but they peaked in volume in manufacturing volume in 2010. And the reason why that is, is so important is that volumes now are steadily dropping. You can see that. And, and we use Wright's law to explain why this is a problem. And Wright's law essentially says that as you, you, your cumulative manufacturing volume doubles, your cost to manufacture declined by a constant percentage. Now I won't go too much detail on that, but suffice it to say that flash volumes are growing very rapidly, HDD volumes aren't. And so, Flash, because of consumer volumes, can take advantage of Wright's law and that constant reduction, and that was really important for the next generation, which is always more expensive to build. Uh, and so this kind of marks the beginning of the end. Matt, what do you think, what, what's the future hold for spinning disk in your view? Uh, well, I can give you the answer on two levels. On a, on a personal level, uh, it's why I come to work every day. Uh, you know, the the eradication or or extinction of an inefficient thing. Um, you know, I like to say that uh, inefficiency is the bane of my existence, uh, and I think hard drives are largely inefficient. And I'm willing to accept the sort of longstanding argument that um, you know we've seen this transition in block, right? Uh, we're starting to see it repeat itself in in, in unstructured data. Um, and I'm willing to accept the argument that cost is a vector here, and it most certainly is, right? HDDs have been considerably cheaper uh, than 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 flash storage, um, you know, even to this day, uh, you know, up up to this point, right? But we're starting to approach the point where you sort of reach a a three x sort of um, you know differentiator between the cost of an HDD and an SDD, and you know that really is that point in time when uh, you begin to pick up. Uh, a lot of volume and velocity. And so, you know, that tends to map directly to, you know, what you're seeing here, which is, you know, a, a, a slow decline, uh, which I think is going to become even more rapid, kind of probably starting around next year, um, where you start to see SDS, excuse me, SSDs, uh, you know, really replacing HDDs uh, at a much more rapid clip, particularly on the unstructured data side. And it's largely around cost. The, the workloads that we talked about, robots and warehouses, or, you know, other types of advanced machine learning and artificial intelligence type applications and workflows, you know, they require a degree of performance that a hard drive just can't deliver. We are, we are seeing sort of the um, creative, innovative uh, disruption of an entire industry right before our eyes. It's a fun thing to live through. Yeah, and, and we would agree. I mean, it doesn't, the premise there is that it, it, it doesn't have to be less expensive. We think it will be by, you know, the, the second half or early second half of this decade. But even if it's a, we think around a 3X delta, the value 
of, of SSD relative to spinning disk is going to overwhelm, just like with your laptop. You know, it got to the point where you said, why would I ever have a spinning disk in my laptop? We see the same thing happening here. Um, and, and so, and we're talking about, you know, raw capacity, you know, put in yeah. compression and dedupe and everything else that you really can't do with spinning disk because of the performance issues you can do with flash. Okay, let's come back to UFFO. Can we dig into the challenges specifically that, that this solves for customers? Give me, give us some examples. Yeah, so you know, I mean, if we if we think about the examples, um, you know, the the, the robotic one, um, I think is 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 the one that I think is the marker for you know, kind of 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 the the modern side of 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 what we see here. Um, but what we're you know what we're what we're seeing from a trend perspective, which you know, not everybody is deploying robots, right? Um, you know, there, there's there's many companies that are you know uh, that aren't going to be in either the robotic business. Uh, or, or even thinking about, you know, sort of future type oriented type things. But what they are doing is greenfield applications are being built on object, um, generally not on not on file and, and and not on block. And so, you know, the rise of of object as sort of the the sort of let's call it the 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 next great protocol for, um, you know, for uh, for for modern workloads, right? This is this is that that modern application coming to the forefront, and that could be anything from you know financial institutions, you know, right down through um, even we've even seen it in, seen it in oil and gas. Uh, we're also seeing it um, across across healthcare. Uh, so you know, as 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 companies take the opportunity, as industries take the this opportunity to modernize, you know, they're modernizing not on things that are are leveraging, you know, um, you know, sort of archaic disk technology. They're 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 really focusing on 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 object, but they still have file workflows that they need to that they need to be able to support. And so having the ability to be able to deliver those things from one device in a capacity orientation or a performance orientation, uh, while at the same time. Uh, dramatically simplifying uh, the overall administration of your environment, both physically and non-physically, is a key driver. So the great thing about object is it's simple. It's a kind of a get put metaphor. Um, it's, yep. It scales out, you know, because it's got metadata associated with the data uh, and, and, and it's cheap. Uh, the drawback is you don't necessarily associate it with high performance and, and, and as well, most applications don't, you know, speak in that language, they speak in the language of file, you know, or as you mentioned, block. So I, I see real opportunities here. If I have some, some data that's not necessarily frequently accessed, you know, every day, but yet I want to then, whatever, end of quarter or whatever it is, I want to, I want to, or, or machine learning, or I want to apply some AI to that data. I want to bring it in and then ap apply a file format uh, because for, Performance reasons, is that right? Maybe you could unpack that a little bit. Yeah, so, um, you know, we see, I mean, I, I think you described it well, right? Um, but I don't think object necessarily has to be slow, um, and nor does it have to be, um, you know, because when you think about, you brought up a good point with metadata, right? Being able to scale to a billions of object, being able to scale to billions of objects, excuse me, is of value, right? Um, and I think people do traditionally associate object with slow, but it's not necessarily slow anymore, right? We we did a, a sort of unofficial survey of 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 our of our customers and our employee base, and when people described object, they thought of it as like law firms and storing a word doc, if right. you will. Um, and that that's just you know I think that there's a, a, um, a lack of understanding or a misnomer around what modern what modern object has become, and performant object particularly at scale when we're talking about billions of objects, you know, that's the next frontier, right? Um, is it at pace performance wise with, you know, the other protocols? No, uh, but it's making leaps and grounds. So you, you talked a little bit more about some of the verticals that you see. I mean, I think when I think of financial services, I think of transaction processing, but of course they have a lot of tons of unstructured data. Are there any yeah. patterns you're seeing by, by vertical market? Um, we're, you know, we're not, that's the interesting thing. Um, and, you know, um, as a, as a, as a, as a company with a, with a block heritage or a block DNA, those patterns were pretty easy to spot, right? There were a certain number of databases that you really needed to support Oracle, SQL, some Postgres work, et cetera. Then kind of the modern databases around Cassandra and things like that. You knew that there were going to be VMware environments. You know, you could, you could sort of see the trends and where things were going. 
unstructured data is such a, a broader horizontal um, thing, right? So, you know, inside of oil and gas, for example, you have, you know, um, you have specific applications and bespoke infrastructures for those applications. Um, you know, inside of media entertainment, you have the same thing. The, the trend that we're seeing, the commonality that we're seeing is the modernization of, you know, object as a starting point for all of the, all, all of the net new workloads within, within those industry verticals, right? That, that's the most common request we see is what's your object roadmap? What's your, you know, what's your, what's your object strategy? You know, where do you think, where do you think object is going? So um, there isn't any, um, you know, sort of, uh, there's no, there's no path. Uh, it's really just kind of a wide open field in front of us with common requests across all industries. So the amazing thing about Pure, just as, as a kind of a little you know, quasi you know, armchair historian in the industry, is Pure was really the only company in many, many years to be able to achieve escape velocity, break through a billion dollars. I mean, 3PAR couldn't do it, Isilon couldn't do it, Compellent couldn't do it, I, I could go on. But Pure was able to achieve that as an independent company. Uh, and so you become a leader. You look at the Gartner Magic Quadrant, you're a leader in there. I mean, if you made it this far, you got to have some chops. And so. Of course, it's very competitive. There are a number of other storage suppliers that have announced products that unify object and file. So I'm interested in how Pure differentiates. Why Pure? Um, it's a great question. Um, and it's one that, uh, you know, having been a long time Puritan, uh, you know, I take pride in answering. Um, and it's, it's actually a really simple answer. Um, it's, it's business model, innovation, and technology. Right, the, the the technology that goes behind how we do what we do, right? And I don't mean the product, right? Innovation is product, but having a better support model, for example, um, or having on the business model side, you know, evergreen storage, right? Where we sort of look at your relationship to us as a subscription, right? Um, you know, we're going to sort of take the thing that that you've had, and we're going to modernize that thing in place over time, such that you're not rebuying that same you know, terabyte or, you know, petabyte of storage that you've, that you, that you've paid for over time. So, um, you know, sort of three legs of the stool uh, that, that have made, you know, pure clearly differentiated. I think the market has, has recognized that um, you're, you're right. It's, it's hard to break through to a billion dollars. Um, but I look forward to the day that, you know, we, we have $2 billion products. And I think with, uh, you know, that rise in, in unstructured data growing to 80% by 2025 and, you know, the massive transition that, you know, you guys have noted in 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 your HDD slide. Uh, I think it's a, a huge opportunity for us on you know the other unstructured data side of the house. You know the other thing I'd, I'd add, Matt, and I've talked to Kaz about this is is it's simplicity first. I've asked them why don't you do this, why don't you do that, and the answer is always the same: is that adds complexity, and we we put simplicity for the customer ahead of everything else, and I think that served you very very well. What about the economics of, of, of unified file and object? I mean, if you bring in additional value, presumably there's a, there, there's a cost to that, but there's got to be also a business case behind it. What kind of impact have you seen uh, with customers? Yeah, I mean, look, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to something I mentioned earlier, which is just the reclamation of floor space and power and cooling, right? Um, you know, there's a, you know, there's a, people, people, people want to search for kind of the, the, the sexier element, if you will, when it comes to uh, looking at how we, how, how you, know, you derive value from something. But the reality is if you're reducing your power consumption by, you know, by, by a material percentage, um, power bills matter in big, in big data centers. Um, you know, customers typically are, are, are facing, a, you know, a paradigm of, well, I, I, I want to go to the cloud, but, you know, the cloud turned out to be more expensive than I thought it was going to be. Or, you know, I've figured out what I can use in the cloud and I thought it was going to be everything, but it's not going to be everything. So hybrid's where we're landing, but I want to be out of the data center business and I, I don't want to have a team of 20 storage people to match, you know, to administer my storage. Um, you know, so there's sort of this, this very tangible value around, you know, hey, if, if I could manage, um, you know, uh, multiple petabytes with one full-time engineer, uh, because the system, uh, to, to your and Kaz's point, was radically simpler to administer, didn't require someone to be running around swapping drives all the time, would that be a value? The answer is yes, 100% of the time, right? Um, and then you start to look at, okay, all right, well, on the UFFO side, from a product perspective, hey, if I have to manage a you know bespoke environment for this application, if I have to manage a bespoke environment for this application and a bespoke environment for this application and a bespoke environment for this application, I'm managing four different things. And can I actually share data across those four different things? There's ways to share data, but most customers, it gets, gets too complex. 
how do you even know what your what your gold dot master copy is of data if you have it in four different places or you try to have it in four different places and it's four different spot siloed infrastructures mm -hmm. so when you get to the sort of the side of you know how do we how do you measure value in ufo it's actually being able to have all of that data concentrated in one place so that you can share it from application to application got it I'm interested, we have a couple minutes left. I'm interested in the, the update on FlashBlade, you know, generally, but also I have a specific question. I mean, look, getting file right is, is hard enough. Uh, you just announced SMB support for FlashBlade. I'm interested in, you know, how, how that fits in. I think it's kind of obvious with file and object converging, but give us the update on, on FlashBlade and maybe you could address that specific question. Yeah, so um, look, I mean, we're, we're um, you know, tremendously excited about the growth of FlashBlade. Uh, you know, we, we, we found workloads we never expected to find. Um, you know, the rapid restore workload was one that was actually brought to us from, from, from a customer actually, um, and has become, you know, one of, our, one of our top two, three, four, you know, workloads. So, um, you know, we're really happy with the trend we've seen in it. Um, and, you know, mapping back to, you know, thinking about HDDs and SSDs, you know, we're well on a path to building a, a billion dollar our business here. So, you know, we're very excited about that. Um, but to your point, you know, you don't just snap your fingers and get there, right? Um, you know, we've learned that doing file and object uh, is, is harder than block um, because there's more things that you have to go do. For one, you're basically focused on three protocols, SMB, NFS, and S3, not necessarily in that order. Um, but to your point about SMB, uh, you know, we, we are uh, on the path through to releasing, um, you know, SMB, uh, full full native SMB support in in the system that will allow us to uh, service customers. We have a limitation with some customers today where they'll have an SMB portion of their NFS workflow, um, and we do great on the NFS side. Um, but you know we didn't we didn't have the ability to plug into the SMB component of their workflow. So that's going to open up a lot of opportunity for us um, on on that front. Um, and you know we continue to you know invest significantly across the board in in areas like security, which is you know become a, a more than just a hot button you know today security has always been there but it feels like it's blazing hot today um oh, yeah. and so you know going through the next couple of years we'll be looking at uh you know developing some some um you know pretty material security elements of the product as well so uh well on a path to a billion dollars is the net on that and uh you know we're, we're we're fortunate to have have smb here and we're looking forward to introducing that to to those customers that have you know nfs workloads today with an smb component yeah nice tailwind good tam expansion strategy matt thanks so much uh we're, we're out of time but really appreciate you coming on the program. We appreciate you having us and uh, thanks much, Dave. Good to see you. All right, good to see you. And you're watching the convergence of file and object. Keep it right there. We'll be back with more right after this short break.